When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth. If Leo name, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to heart of worship. And it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for things I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. King of endless world. No one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself. It's not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. You're looking into my heart, into my heart. Looking into my heart, into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for thing I made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. See, so God is looking into our hearts. Okay, this song says, I have a maker. He formed my heart before even time began. My life was in his hands. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began. 
来扶持你。Say one more time. I have a maker. He formed my heart. For even time began, life was innocent. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls. Hears me when I call. Hears me when I call. Knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls. Hears me when I call. Hears me when I call. Me his own. He'll never leave me. Matter where I go, he knows my name. He knows my every thought. That fall hears me when I call. Hears me when I call. I have a father. I have a father. He calls me his own. So I'm going to ask Lino to start in prayer. Amen. All right. So thank you, Lino. All right. So welcome back to the Saturday Bible study, and we are in the book of Genesis. I know we had a long gap in between two weeks. We didn't have the class, but that's okay. 
uh, as long as you've been reading the book and you have been personally being edified, I'm sure you've been doing your homework. So this evening we are going to refocus on the passage that we have already studied. Okay, because just to look at the curse in detail, we told uh, last week about, I mean, the last time we had the class, we had done uh, verses 8 to 24. So this evening we are going to look a little more, you know, uh, scrutinize uh, a little more uh, verses 14 to 28, 20, I mean, 24, okay, 14 to 24. The curse, a little more deeper look at the curse. Last one was the fall of man, and this is the curse. Okay, So what are the things that we can derive from this curse? And from this curse, what are the things that we can, uh, you know, we see in human life? That is what we, we are going to look at next week. Okay, What can we derive from this curse? What are the effects of this curse on mankind? That we will look at a little bit next week as we go into the next generation of people, that is Cain and Abel. Okay, So... Let's start with verses 14 onwards. Okay, here we go. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, now we saw the previous passage that man was trying to cover up sin, and uh, but God would not be deceived. No, God cannot be deceived. When we sin, we cannot hide it from God. None of our thoughts, none of our actions are hidden from God's sight. God sees everything and God knows everything. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, eternal God, and He is a God who cannot be deceived. So all three, man, woman, as well as the serpent deserves to be punished. And here God is going to punish each one in turn, turn by turn, in a way that it is going to affect the future of the world. Okay, So God is going to punish each one. God is going to punish them turn by turn and in a way that that is going to affect the whole of the world, the future of the world. First, we start with the serpent. What is, the, what is the first thing he has given in terms of its movement? Apparently, the, the serpent had legs to walk on. And last time we saw that, you know, it was a kind, a kind of a, a in, uh, what do you call it, um, insult. Or it was a, a, a condemnation that it was asked to crawl on its belly and eat dust. Okay, so now the serpent which could walk on its legs is now condemned to crawl on its belly and eat dust. Now, from point of dignity to indignity. Okay? So that is how God's curse has led the serpent to come from dignity, a point of dignity to a point of indignity. Okay? Now this curse is in two parts. If you look at it carefully, you will see that it is in two parts. One is as an animal. Okay? That is where this crawling and uh, no legs part come in. Okay? As an animal... The first part of the curse is that it will crawl on its belly. It will not have any more legs. But the second part of the, the curse, you know, uh, the enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, this part of the curse is, a, is as, a, the, uh, you know, as a function. It functions, uh, evil, the serpent was functioning as a symbol of evil. And so the enmity would be, versus the woman okay the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent will be having enmity with each other and this enmity is going to persist and till when ultimately one will be victorious over the other you no know, it says here one is going to be up than the other right between your offspring and how he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel so ultimately the woman's seed will be victorious over you. But the victory will come at a price. Okay? You have to pay a big price for this victory. Okay? So that is what, as a symbol of evil, there will be enmity between the seed of the woman 
and the seed of the serpent. Okay, so enmity will be persisting not only in this generation but it will continue between the seed which means in the next generations also there will be enmity. Ultimately one is going to rule and become victorious over the other. How? By crushing its head and the latter one uh, uh, the serpent seed is going to strike its heel. Okay, so it is bad news for the serpent but it's good news for the woman and his and her seed. For her and her for her seed it is good news for the woman and her offspring there is good news but for the serpent there is bad news okay now why is it bad news and why is it good news see the the amount of uh, you know the, the the damage that the serpent gets is far more than what the seed of the woman will get okay compared to the uh, the head crushing of the serpent, the crushing of the heel is very insignificant, very less. Okay? That is why it is bad news for the serpent because the head is going to be crushed. That means no more life. Okay? No, more, no more of that, uh, what do you call that? The, uh, the, the, the conflict will not, no longer be there because the head will be crushed. But the biting of the heel is very insignificant compared to the crushing of the head. So, literally, if you take this as animal, then we have a problem. Why? Right? Actually, it is true because the seed of the woman is the human race and the seed of the serpent is other serpents. And what happens? Uh, I mean, I'm not meaning in the sense like how it is, if you watch uh, Discovery Channel or uh, National Geographic, you have these uh, guys, you know, who are very experts in handling poisonous snakes and all that they they go hunting for snakes pull them out of their you know uh, their small holes and you know they they wrap them themselves around each other and not that kind of you know uh, not those kind of people they are very rare people okay they are trained people they always show this you know before their program do not try this at home it is done by experts and they are experts in handling snakes you know like our vava suresh and all that you know we saw him last year the year before last and he's a very skilled man in ha you know handling the seeds of the serpent the other serpents snakes okay but that's not what the curse literally means it would if you literally take it it would mean enmity between mankind and snakes the sons or the serpent's seed but here it is not too literal it is actually symbolic and because of that, we understand that the seed of the woman is all those who follow God. And ultimately, the seed of the woman who is going to crush the head is Jesus. But the seed of the serpent is the world system that rejects God, people who reject God. And ultimately, Satan's head is going to be crushed by Jesus on the cross. Okay, so. If you take that as a symbolic thing, that is correct. Why? Because the next story continues the same, uh, you know, theme, Cain and Abel. And uh, Cain is going to be the son of the, the seed of the serpent. And there is going to be enmity between the seed of the woman and seed of the serpent. Cain kills Abel. And so uh, the next story highlights this and the theme continues. <laughs> So that is the understanding that we have to take from this because it is not literal, it is not too literal. The first part is literal, but the second part is because as a functioning of the symbol of evil. Okay, hope that is clear on that. Coming to the next person who was cursed. First was the serpent, second was the woman. Okay, now the woman's curse also comes in two parts. What is that? First one uh, has to do with her child, childbearing. And the second one has to do with her husband. Okay, We will read that first and then I will go into that. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Okay. Now, so uh, both these people like the child and the husband are, are people whom she is related to, she is fond of. She has, uh, you know, she loves them dearly, but both of them cause her pain. Okay, I'll tell you the first one. First one is uh, multiply your pain in childbearing. 
the word multiply means greatly increase okay now we should understand that even if even if there was no sin there would be pain okay uh, so greatly increase means or multiply means what is intended there would be pain when you are having child birth but it would be greatly increased okay it will be greatly increased so a new degree of pain was added to the process of child birth there was already a set pain for that you know so that pain would be intensified or increased during child birth okay that's what that sentence literally means multiply your pain in child birth okay so uh, in pain you shall bring forth children so a new degree of pain to child birth was added in this what about the husband so if that is the case with the children 16b talks about the husband her relationship with her husband is going to be affected at a psychological level okay now let's read that a little more clearly so that you can get the understanding of it your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you your desire will be for your husband but he shall rule over you okay so some positive thing is happening from the woman towards the husband but some negative thing seems to be happening from the husband to the woman you know she is desiring her husband you know every wife desires her husband and that should be the pattern wives must desire their husbands but the husband also must desire the wife right but here the husband is seeming to rule over her okay so why why this contradiction wife romantically desires her husband and the husband tries to control the person who loves him is that what the bible is saying let's check it out another verse which helps us to understand this word desire your desire shall be for your husband genesis chapter 4 and verse 7 okay god is telling cain cain is upset with abel because cain's sacrifice has not been take accept uh, cain's sacrifice has not been accepted but abel's sacrifice has been accepted by god and god is telling him uh, you know why are you angry why is your face fallen and then he continues on this verse 7 Four of Genesis, verse seven. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Its desire is for you. Now, sin is not desiring for Cain in a romantic way. Okay. so there is no romantic desire involved in when sin is looking at cain so what is sin desiring for in cain sin is desiring to consume him sin is desiring to control him okay so sin is desiring cain to control him sin is desiring to consume cain in a negative sense that is where this desire comes in okay so the same word for desire is used here as well as in chapter 3 and verse 16b okay so what do we understand we understand that when sin affects marriage marital relationships between man and woman your desire your will your wish to control man your husband will be there and he will rule over you you get the see you get the scene okay so when you desire woman desires to control her husband there is a vice versa also husband shall attempt or rule over her wife okay so this is the concept in which the curse is uh, you know is pronounced so she would desire to control her husband and the husband would overpower or rule over her okay now you see this tug of war in marital relationships because sin has affected marriage there is a desire for control there is a power struggle going on in marriages the wife strives to be one up and the husband tries to be one up you no know, one up over the husband one up over the wife see and there will be a constant friction there will be a constant tug of war as to who has control who has control in marriage and that is what breaks when the husband and wife 
come to the Lord and the Lord is ruling over their marital lives, things change between husbands and wives when both become believers, when both submit to the will of the Lord. There will be no power struggle there. They will both try to honor and glorify God in their lives. You see, that is where the difference comes. Well, that's where the changeover comes. In, okay. So here, desire is not in the positive romantic sense. Here, desire is pronounced in the negative sense. Just like in chapter 4, verse 7, it is a desire to control the husband. And the husband will rule over the wife. Now, uh, many people actually justify this passage, uh, you know, uh, use this passage to justify subordination of woman, which this passage does not talk about. You know, because she was the temptress, because she led Adam to sin, that is why control has been given to man. See. So, and secondly, you know, they also uh, claim the first uh, beginning of creation where you know he was derived from adam so because of that she was she was created you know from adam so because of that he is the ruler and she is not you know she has to be you know subdued she has to be in subordination to man so that is actually using our values and our presuppositions to interpret biblical text which is actually the wrong method of interpreting okay our values and our presuppositions should not control us to presuppose things that are not mentioned in the passage. Okay, So understand that God is mentioning about a power struggle that happens within marriage and how one will try to dominate the other. And both are not healthy. That's what it means. Husband trying to rule over the wife and wife trying to dominate the husband. Both are incorrect. Ephesians says it oh so clearly right so i'm not going into that now but the idea that i wanted you to understand is this okay in both childbearing and with her relationship with her husband curse encroaches okay curse comes in and there is an increased degree of pain in childbirth and there is a power struggle coming up between her relationship between her and her husband let's go to adam now so there was a serpent who was cursed Two levels we saw as an animal and as a function, uh, functioning symbol of evil. And sin, woman was cursed in two parts, her relationship, uh, uh, her pain during childbirth and her relationship with her husband. And now let's look at Adam. See, Adam in chapter 2 of Genesis was assigned to work in the garden. He was take, uh, asked to take care of the trees and asked to take care of the fruit of the trees. Now here, tending and guarding are Adam and Eve's both responsibility. Okay, and there is hard work involved. Even without the curse, work was intense because he had to tend, and the garden won't tend itself. Fruits won't pluck by itself. Adam had to go out there and do his job. That is what tending means. Like a caretaker who has been assigned to his task by a gardener, the man has to take care of the garden. You see, so this was the general principle that God had, general guideline that God had given, but now that work would become drudgery, that work would become frustrating for man. See, so an increased level of frustration that comes from, increased level of, uh, you know, hard, hardness or harshness that comes in the work environment came for man. Like how the childbirth, you know, pain was there, but the pain was increased in a degree, the same way, work was hard, but it became harder. It became intense. A new degree of frustration came into the daily work that man was assigned to do. Out of which comes the crying of the man's heart. You know? The futility, the vanity of it all. Where do you see it? The book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, our man Solomon, though he was living in luxury, he observed all these things in man. What is that? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I'm reading verse um, nine, uh, 22 to 23. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 22 to 23. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. This also is vanity. See, 
all the sweat, all the hard work, all the toil, he says, nothing, nothing, vanity, meaningless. Then come to verse 18 and 19. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing what? I must leave it to a man who will come after me. See, I'm not going to be here to enjoy the fruits for a long time. Somebody else is going to take care of. Somebody is going to take care of my land. What I have worked and what happens? Who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. See, so when death comes, I will leave all the work that I have done. It is all undone and is given to somebody else. Somebody else continues the work and who knows if he is wise or foolish. Frustration has ended, entered into work. And here death also has entered into man's life. And so it makes all the work that you have done vanity, vanity, meaningless. You know? Come back to chapter 3. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have not eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken. See, death has entered in. And then, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust shall return. So death has entered in and things have become totally different from what it was when God had entrusted work to Adam. Work became toiling, work became full of thorns and thistles and it became frustration. A degree of frustration was added to work. Now let's look at the next part of it. Man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden, out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drew out the man. In the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, Now, it looks like in this passage, when you read this, when the Lord God said, Behold, now something terrible is going to happen. Let's rush to banish man from here so that he won't you know, go and raid the tree of life also. You know, Get an opportunity and go magically running towards the tree and then take a little bit and eat and then he will live forever. And God is helpless and he is going to look and say, Oh no, what did you do now? You, know, you ate of the tree of life also? Now what am I going to do? How can I reverse this? No, There is no such language present in this. God does not rush to banish man. Nowhere does it say that man did not eat from the tree of life before this. Okay, If you remember chapter 3 verse 3, only one tree was prohibited. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Access was not denied to the tree of life. Which makes us understand man was eating from all the trees of the garden except for that tree till the point that serpent came in. So even he was having from the tree of life and that helped him to live. So, but what happens was now when God has separated man from the tree, the effects of aging sets in. You know? So man as he keeps on eating from the tree of life, he will keep on living forever. And God does not want that. So God removes access to the tree so that aging would set in and he would die. You see, man has to die and that is God's grace. If man were not to die, he would live in sin forever, which should not be permitted. You see, and that is why he places the cherubim. Okay, cherubim. Now, the cherubim shows the warrior side of God. See, till now, he has been shown as creator. Till now, he has been shown as, as the, the gentle gardener. He has been shown as the one who is delegating work, authority, and all these things to man as a, you know, as a father. But now, he is being shown as a warrior. There is another side to God. 
And that is where the cherubim comes in with the flaming sword. Mentioned for the first time in the Bible, angelic being. No? Angelic being. So he is part of the celestial army of God, cherubim. Why is he placed there? To bring order. Chaos has happened because of sin, because of man's disobedience, and God wants to bring in order. And for that, he uses his celestial army, cherubim, with the, with the sword, you know, flaming sword. He has turned every way to guard. See? So, Adam and Eve were unable to guard the place. Adam and Eve failed in their responsibility to guard Eden. And now, that, that has been entrusted to this cherubim, so that Adam and Eve would not go back in and continue to live forever. See, this is grace. This is grace. Grace extended to sinful people. We see the same grace extended to sinful people when God covers them with animal skins. See, man had a temporary solution for covering himself. He sued himself with fig leaves. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says, you know, a temporary arrangement was made. A temporary measure was taken by man to cover himself and God gave him a much more better covering. And that is by the skin of animals. So grace being extended to sinful people is what we see here. You know? Now, there is also a group of people who, who say this, you know, then man called his wife's name Eve, which shows that, you know, Adam naming Eve shows that he has now control over Eve because God has cursed her like that, you know. But uh, because Adam was used to name all the animals, which showed him that he has dominion over them in chapter 2. Before he created Eve, you know, he, uh, uh, he called all the beasts of the earth and Adam was naming all of them one by one, you know. Uh, but that does not hold true. I'll tell you why it does not hold true. See, a person naming another person, that is the logic, okay. That's the logic that they want to, uh, you know, portray. They say that if one man is naming another person, that means this person has dominion over the other. Man is a higher creature and animals are lower. So God asked Adam to name the lower. Now here, Adam is naming Eve. So she is lower than Adam. But that logic does not hold true. Okay, I will show you how and then we will finish off this. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16 and verse... Uh, Genesis chapter 16 is about Abraham's uh, uh, you know, uh, mistake with Hagar. Okay. Genesis chapter 16 and Hagar is thrown out from the house. Okay, So Genesis chapter 16 and verse 13, Hagar is blessed by God. She is seen by God and God helps her. And so in verse 13, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. Okay? It lies between Kadesh and Bad. Here is Hagar naming God. You are God of seeing. Okay? Now, because Hagar is naming God, it does not make God under Hagar. No, she does not rule over God. She has no control over God. She just gives him a name because of his character. The way that he has seen her in her trouble. See? So it does not prove that naming of a, of a person or a being gives the other person control over it. It does not say that. Okay? So here it's not Adam trying to control you know, Eve by naming her. Again, it just shows that her role is defined there. She was the mother of all living. Which means she, she was the one... Uh, you know, the, the literal word is uh, what the Mayalam Bible says. Hawa. Okay. H A W W A. Okay. That's that's the literal translation that comes from Eve is actually the Englishized version of that. So the literal translation would say Hawa, which means the mother of all living. Grace extended to man, grace extended to woman, and grace extended to them even as they left the the Eden, the garden that God had 
created okay so with this we will end today's session because i want to talk next week about the effects of this curse and how it is lasting how it is persisting among mankind okay that's our topic for next week as we run through you know cain and abel's story we will also dwell upon the effects of the curse in the lives of human being okay so let's end here if you have questions you could ask first let's pray and close the session heavenly father we want to thank you because you're a god of grace god who extends his grace to sinful man and we see your loving heart even in this cursing that that came towards serpent the woman and the man what a promise it is that god has provided a way for us even inside the curse god has pronounced blessing for us even within his curse we thank you o lord because you are all knowing you are all seeing and father your wisdom is beyond measure and as we look at you as we understand your word this evening help us to acknowledge that you have graciously given us work whether it is man who is toiling or whether it is woman who is toiling it is by the sweat of our brow that we would eat food and there is a frustration that is involved in work but father you have given us work and that itself is grace god showing grace to us you have greatly increased the pain for women in childbirth but father you have given the blessing of childbirth and we praise you for that if not for that blessing we would never have jesus if not for that blessing we would not have joy in families so in spite of the curse there is so much to be joyful so much to be thankful for and we are we are filled with awe as we look at this curse how god could make blessings come out of this curse we thank you and we praise you in jesus precious name we pray amen